episode of Sim Sundays by Gridfinder, you know, your weekly source of sim racing chat and interviews. And then, of course, if you watch us live, we also do a little bit of racing. Today, we're going to be in iRacing a little bit later. If you'd like to join in, go ahead and sign into your iRacing account. We're actually on the hosted races already under Sim Sundays and join in with us. Today is a great day because I'm back with Tom. It's been four weeks now that we've actually been separated and not actually together on an episode of Sim Sundays. Tom, it's so nice to see you again, sir. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. It has been a while. We had two back-to-back -back holidays, not each. You were away in freaking Hawaii yes. for two weeks, which was <laughs> kind of mind-blowing for me because I was all excited for my holiday in Mallorca, sat getting some sun. So we're, 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 we're tanned, we're rested, we're ready to go. We are. It's, it's very weird because I've gotten so accustomed to talking to you every single week, multiple times a week, and then it's been literally a month. Haven't said anything but a couple of text messages back and forth, and it's been very interesting. So We'd fall today, out with me. <laughs> today, we have a very special guest today. Not that, you know, all of our guests aren't special, but this one is super, super interesting. Tom, why don't you go ahead and take the intro for us? Okay, well, the... Introduction is very short, it's short and punchy. This is Seb Hawkins, esports executive at Williams Racing. For the second time, we have an actual Formula One team member with us, which is baffling. So welcome, Seb. Mind blowing. Hi. Hello. Absolutely mind blowing that we were able to to make that happen in the first year. Seb, thanks for joining us today, sir. And uh Thanks for picking racing. You know, something that's interesting, interesting about the iRacing world, even though Tom and I do run a sim racing business, we frequently don't get, or well, weird way to say that, but we don't get to race as often as we'd like. And iRacing is one of those things that I think is a very cool um, platform. What made you pick iRacing over, let's say, AC or ACC or, well, I guess there's a ton of options in there. But what made you Formula go iRacing today? Formula yeah. One, yes, there is that, yeah. Yeah, I guess simply put, it's the one that I started on and it's the one that I intend to finish on because I'm just so used to driving it and it's a lot easier than any of the other ones to get used to when you've got limited time. But it's just like uh, anything, you know, you go back to what you enjoy and iRacing always seems to be that one that I just click with easier. Um, not to say I don't play the other ones, but yeah, iRacing always is, is kind of a leader or something at least I feel comfortable in every sense of it. So. Right, right. And it's a very good idea to stick with something you're comfortable in, especially in the podcasting uh, yeah. kind of space here, because one thing that you'll notice is later on, we're going to bug you as much as we can while we're on the track so that uh, hopefully Tom and I can actually pass you and uh, maybe keep up a little bit. But we'll see how that goes later on. <laughs> it's a on. good plan. <laughs> so what is your overall responsibility over at Williams? What, what do you actually do for them over there at the esports side of things? So I'm team manager of the esports team. So esports executive at Williams Racing is the official title for the Williams Racing side. And then it's for the Williams esports team. I'm, I'm team manager. So um, that's managing all of our drivers across the whole roster. So anything in iRacing, ACT, R Factor, you name it. Um, but also managing our engineering team and everything else. We've got the builds our structure in the team. Um, so that's quite a lot of people. Um, but also, you know, the administration side with every different event that we take part in and just generally covering everything that happens. So obviously we've just gone into F1 Esports and uh, Le Mans Virtual Series has been our probably two biggest this year. Um, and that all kicked off a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's a busy period for us now. Wow, wow. So how many races do you say a month you guys actually enter into? I would say... It's, I usually say it's around 10 on average a week, I'd say roughly. Um, so it's quite a lot. So if you say between 30 to 40 to a month, and they vary in kind of how high priority and you know, where they are in the kind of to the main stage, shall we say. So some stuff's just to keep drivers active and busy. And often drivers will also pitch, say, hey, there's this that I'm really interested in doing. Um, but other stuff is actually just, you know, that main stage stuff. So F1 Esports, some on virtual series, and then anything else that kind of gets thrown on top of us. We do go through periods of having a lot on, and then periods where it drops off a little bit too. Wow, wow. So how many drivers did you say you have? Did you say a number? I forget. I always say 45, but it fluctuates a lot, and it's definitely going higher than lower. 
So that's interesting because Gridfinder is obviously more grassroots league, small community style stuff. But you're kind of doing it at like a macro level with professional level esports, and that's that's pretty interesting. So how do you recruit drivers? Is it something where, let's say, you you see another driver racing in one of the championships that you're in, they do really well, maybe they beat you, and then you kind of nudge them a little bit and say, hey, put on our jersey and race for us? How do you do that? It's sometimes some of that, sometimes... Well, you know, there's different ways of looking at talent, and, and it also depends on the game, right? So, i racing, you have to have the i rating, otherwise, you're sort of not in the pool of drivers we'd look for. But for the for some of the other drivers, it's just a case of that they're starting to pump good lap times in. Or we've seen good progression in the last kind of few months. Generally, top teams are keeping their eyes out for these these guys anyway. But usually, it's just a case of just speaking with people at the right time. Often, drivers want to have the chance to drive with us, which is the nicest way, is the easiest way, shall we say. Sure. Um, but sometimes drivers are you know, with other teams and have to kind of break out those contracts or whatever they need to do. Um, but it's quite a nice kind of driver's market, shall we say, for sim racing. A lot of it's about making sure that what each driver does is right for them and the right jump to come to us. And we're not just closing a door with any of the teams. Everybody's got a good team in their, their own right. So um, for us, in terms of recruitment, we've got kind of those pro drivers that are established pros. We will often speak with them and take a bit of time to kind of get to know them but on the other side we've got um, an academy as well so the, the esports academy side of things is a good place for drivers to sort of trial out without us particularly being there to manage their day-to-day schedules so much but more to see how proactive they can be and whether they're professional enough to be somebody that we believe would be a good fit to represent the brand and team and how were you recruited how did you become <laughs> the recruiter of these drivers how did that happen <laughs> Um, so I started off with sim racing probably about 10, over 10 years ago. Again, it's the same as the 45 number. It's, it's a rough amount of approximation. But um, about 10 years ago, I got involved in sim racing. Um, and through basically COVID happening was the time where I had to change what my career was and completely flip things on, on their head. Um, I'm a massive motorsport fan, so I've always watched everything and chance to get involved with Williams initially with, with the build-up of sim racing and esports in Williams. I managed to just get on that train at the right time. Um, like everybody says, it's just everything happened at the right time, but it really was the case with this. Um, so I joined the team managing a very small percentage of it and I've ended up in a situation where I'm managing all the competition side of stuff. Wow. So, yeah, <clears throat> okay. it's, uh, it's ramped up a lot, but also has our kind of progression as a team and what we do, the amount of staff members. And so, um, so as it's built, I've come, we've kind of got on that path and, and taken sort of the journey of sim racing with williams interesting so so just jumping back real quick to the how you get your drivers so it's not like a thing where some sim racer can be like you know what i'm going to put together a nice little demo reel and send it on over to seb on social network through dm and they're going to recruit me it's not it's not like a apply for said positions right it's it's tough with that because I think if we said yes to everybody that sends an email to us, we'd have a massive academy and massive team. And it's yeah. tough to see somebody that stands out on an email because it's not really an industry where I don't think we can judge how good a sim racer is based on how good they can sort of speak to a company and, and sell themselves. Sure. And obviously we've got varying ages as well. So, you know, an older kind of, let's say sim racer, 25 or whatever, has had a chance to put a CV in at a job and knows how to present themselves. Whereas a 16-year-old that's just worked out what Outlook is mainly used for, uh, it's not really fair to kind of judge them on, on, in that way. So again, I think it's better for us to look on track. And I think F1 Esports is a huge area where we have a bigger pool of drivers that are keen to get involved with us. So we have a lot of young drivers messaging, wanting to be involved. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have a nice inbox where that goes to. And it's a bit like fan mail. We do try our best to filter through it but obviously there's always things slipping through um, oh, yeah. but we just we just can't take everybody on and, and and i think as we've seen sim race and progress more we're seeing more of that interest which is also good because it's it's amazing to have that interest and it's amazing uh, for people to want to be involved but yeah there has to be there has to be a limit it sounds <laughs> like you need a decent sized team right and i don't mean drivers i mean support staff so like support staff, yeah yeah, what is your what is your, your the team behind the team? What does it look like? So we have at the top at the helm we have Stephen English, who's our director of esports. So he's looking over 
the competition side, but also looking over the hospitality, the revenue side, shall we say, of, of the team and, and generally where it needs to go for it to be something that stays um, stable in the team and something that Williams wants to carry on supporting. Um, and so that's kind of his main job. We've got Javi Guerrero, which he uh, is my kind of like guy that steps next to me. He's team up, so he does everything from flight logistics for drivers uh, coming over to do team visits to social media. Uh, that's everything. Um, we've got Ewan, who's our press officer, um, who's also working with us and has been here for a few months. Um, and we've also got uh, a broadcast producer now that's helping with the streaming side of things. So a lot of these kind of roles have come about because mainly we were taking them on. And before I was in the team as well, it was just Stephen and Javi. Um, I came in and helped out and did my bit and, and took on the huge workload as well. And then just slowly as we've kind of developed, we've been able to bring in more staff, um, which helps us massively. One thing I noticed from um, the chat I had with Guillaume from Alpine is that not only did the team seem quite comprehensive in the variation of support roles so they had all sorts of people in, including people looking at neural tracking right for the for the drivers and looking at their response times and that sort of stuff but then they also had some industry partners so they were talking about their industry partners for different kind of like glasses to help with eye fatigue and <laughs> the different and their kind of their technical setups now i noticed that you've got chill blast and umbro and ben q on your jersey so how involved do you get to be with your industry partners and how do they how do they kind of make a difference to lap time in the in the races? Yeah, I mean, if you take Chill Blast as, as a partner, you know, we have a PC go down as a, with us on Monday. By Tuesday, we've got a new one on the doorstep. So that's the kind of service we get with these guys. And these guys are here with support online as well, but also to, to send out new parts and products for, for whatever we need. So in that sense, a lot of these partners on the, on the show are all here to help us out. Uh, and I think massively in terms of the competition side but also the hospitality side as well you know we have the sports lounge with 20 f1 uh, setups in there and loads of different rigs and they're here to help us with all of that because it's good for them it's good for us and it's a nice kind of crossover and partnership with, with these brands too um and again you could probably call them support staff in their own right because without them we would be left with me on a zoom call hoping to fix somebody's pc across the world right. um and as we've got you know an evolved and got a bigger team of people you know it's it, it helps to have those people there so yeah massively these guys are important to us um and again we've, we've got the kind of help with the um, nutritional and psychological stuff too and that all sits kind of in the background as well with our partners nutrition yeah yeah so so we sorry i just wanted to pick up on that so you, you lit so there's a there's an interesting sorry to jump in here there's an interesting kind of debate at the moment about the term esports right? Is it really a sport? Now, when you look at things like League of Legends, Call of Duty, Rocket League, etc., you don't have to have that much physical prowess to be the best in the world at those titles, where with sim racing, you definitely do. So I'm interested to see, you know, how much the pro teams are really genuinely trying to create athletes, like esports athletes. I think what we're trying to do is is support drivers to not be seen you know a lot of what we're doing is, is trying to make sure that sim racing isn't seen or even esports isn't seen as williams having drivers who sit in their bedrooms all day don't socialize and just drink yeah. two liters of coke every day and, and just waste away what we're looking to do is make sure that these guys have the resources it's, it's entirely up to them as well if you want to have that support you can have that support you can have a person there to help you if you don't you don't have to have that it's not forced upon um so we're looking to make sure that anybody that's sit there and sees kind of the marginal gains of what a race driver might have they can also start to implement and that into their own lifestyle but with the understanding of why and how long that sort of takes to develop in, in kind of the sim racer world additionally it's a bit of a case study for us to see well, what is it that makes a sim racer particularly good is it that physical fatigue doesn't matter and as long as you're there and you're able to eat healthy then actually it's fine or, or what is it where does it kind of go to and what you what are you seeing at the moment are you seeing a strong correlation between you know the drivers who go out for a run four times a week and uh, are into their i don't know their yoga or all they're kind of doing um <laughs> what's it called when you do the kind of the uh, aptitude style tests where you're looking mm. at reaction times and cognitive functions and stuff are you, are you seeing a correlation between lap time and commitment to those practices 
I think we're seeing we so we're still in the, the kind of stages of collecting that data, shall we say? Um, but what we're seeing is is drivers who are kind of mentally feeling a lot better and physically feeling a lot better from the work that they're doing with us and, and are genuinely just in a more positive kind of frame of mind when it comes to, to working and, and working towards testing. A lot of what we do is making sure that practice is that if you do have four events in a month, it's not that you never get to see the outdoors again, it's that we work with you to plan out how best for that to fall. Um, and if it is something that is, you know, they might have university or things happening outside of sim racing, and we've also got to be conscious of that to make sure it's fair to them. We don't want to over work them and then you know, education gets left behind so it's just kind of about the main priority for this is to help build a healthy lifestyle right i mean like i say you don't want them to be sat at home and we also don't want to be seen like that because the next generation that are coming up through the ranks of esports also have parents that are still understanding what esports is and kind of we're waiting for that to to kind of flip on its head and, and that the parents know what esports is for them to understand well actually it's okay for my son or daughter to be sat in the bedroom on a sim rig but, yeah, Know, 10 hours a day um and basically it's kind of a every single bit's kind of a piece to the jigsaw right that we're trying to just support and make sure every element that's involved with these drivers is is thought about rather than them just being signed on a piece of paper told to put in a lap time and just left yeah. their own devices because mm-hmm. um it's such a such a mentally demanding um sport and i do use the word sport too i believe that we are getting to the stages where this is a sport and i think we should treat it as a sport too i think if we left it and that and debated about it would be too far gone that these drivers would miss that support and i think while we're in a position where we can help i think we should even if the drivers don't want it and they say no at least we're there to offer it because again some of the drivers are at university maybe they're doing sports uh, degrees and they do have a good understanding of uh, you know physical fitness and, and where to train and they do go to the gym some of our drivers don't do that at all and just haven't been exposed to that kind of environment um so it's important that we just you know bring everybody together as best as possible now I think once you get one or two drivers, or maybe more than that, that are working well in the gym, everybody else wants to jump on board in a nice, healthy working environment. Right, right. that makes sense. I mean, uh, this this world of pro esports absolutely baffles me, and I have about a thousand questions. <laughs> but the one, there's something you said there, which which really stuck out to me was um, that you have to educate the parents. Now that's interesting because, of course, esports drivers tend to be younger, and I don't know if that's because they've maybe started younger you know so so generations coming through will probably start gaming from the age of what four five six if you include maybe like ipads and nintendo switches and i remember what you know when i was at school i was always told that the, the, the classic mantra is you can't spend your whole life playing video games well <laughs> actually now you like, can <laughs> like if you look at some of the big streamers you can and now obviously they're you know, they're kind of, uh, they're rare cases. And it's in the same vein almost as, you know, the, the, the kids at school who were great at football, the, a lot of the teachers would be like, look, to be a pro footballer is nearly impossible. So make sure you focus on your exams as well. But esports yep. is opening up now as like another strand where kids genuinely can find this outlet for their passion that could serve them their, their whole life. But I'm interested <laughs> to know, what the conversations with parents have been like like is that something you do is that something you've done have you had there must be some interesting stories about chatting to parents being like esports is a real thing <laughs> yeah it's it's tough because it's not so it's not something that i'm actively doing all the time but it is something that when we bring say a driver that's under 18 they do have to have a parent or guardian involved when we're, we're doing stuff um you know and so we do speak with them and we have kind of had conversations with different parents and um Often it's just about them going through that process of understanding what it is, like you say, and then often that they, they have that realization that what they're doing is actually really good, um, and that they sort of been watching on the TV downstairs while their son or daughter's upstairs, and then they've seen that you know there's press releases and things are happening, and they're actually starting to realize that they're making a living from it, or should we say making money? What's living at home? Um, mm-hmm. But that they could have a really good future in this, and I think again, like I say. If we're there to help and support and, and make sure they don't say, right, well, I'm going to take a year off and be a pro esports player in, in 12 months. If we're saying, no, don't do that. Uh, do your education and reduce the number of sim races you do. Balance your lifestyle. You're still going to get the same thing, but you don't need to overwork in sim racing. You just need to have good performances every time that you're, you're on that stage. Um, so working with them that way brings the parent in and the parent's more accepting of that. And we're also, when I'm working with drivers, one of my things is don't put away your education because 
we also don't know where esports goes in sim racing and it's uncharted territory and it could be that they get like a professional footballer somebody that's aspiring to do a sport they get dropped and they never make the cut and then they look back at what the grades they've got and they go oh, okay what do i do with this Oops, um so yeah. something i'm always saying is let's make sure that we we help these guys and it's something that we as a, as a team are always saying we need to make sure the academic side is is looked after so we're working on making sure that we're involved with the colleges and universities offering the esports courses um that's a huge part and, and thing that we're involved in again with british esports in the uk it's, it's all about making sure that we're working to a healthy lifestyle and, and probably that's one of the biggest things that we're preaching is that these guys can build up some really good skills not only for going to jobs you know the ones that are young enough and about to go out into the world we can help give them some vital team working skills and, and just helping them just fix some of the little mistakes and just using tools like social media that's one of the biggest stakes that we see is is the use of social media um and just working on that with drivers so that i think my ambition is that if a driver would love to be in a real seat one day and working for a team i think that they if they got that chance tomorrow do they have everything they need to show that they have the ability to be a race driver or they're a nice good or balanced blank canvas that can be built into a professional race driver um some of them were lucky some of the drivers are professional race drivers already so they bring a lot of that skill set those and that understanding to and the work kind of flows that they have um into what we do um some of them are keen carters so they also have the fitness the nutrition sides sorted they have to look after their weight they're aware of what they need to do um but they want to spend every day at the race circuit and they want to be carting all the time so again it helps to work with them because even if they don't apply the don't miss education for sim racing they might do it for real world motorsport and stuff too so we're just here to help that balance and ultimately like i say you know don't just contract a driver and say you have to work every single day flat out and do this it is just making sure that the, what they do they have a higher win percentage and it's pure events if ever i mean it's encouraging that the the pro teams are taking this very holistic approach to the individuals that they recruit into their teams something you said there which struck me was um the focus on social media right so some of the most successful esports drivers um have got their partly through their social media strategies and you know they've built up big audiences and then teams will want them not just for their performance but also for the audience that they can bring and the exposure that they can then bring to that team's uh partners and sponsors right um but as much as social media could make a driver it can break a driver and now we've seen <laughs> so many examples and not to single out f1 but I, I think that F1 esports drivers in particular seem to keep coming up with, you know, statements like, you know, I'd like to formally apologize to everyone that watched me for my behavior in my last stream. This doesn't reflect the values from X, Y, and Z, uh, you know, F1 esports team. I'm going to go away and think about it. Blah, blah, blah. And then a couple of days later, the team announces that, you know, they've parted ways and, and that's it. So yeah. how do you deal with that because that must be tough that must be really tough when these kids are so young they're going to make mistakes it doesn't necessarily mm. excuse it in some of the extreme circumstances but sometimes they're just making mistakes and then that can ruin them yeah i think so i think what it is 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 when you explain to a driver the consequences of what can happen they sit there and go yes i i, I can clearly and i can see how that can be detrimental to partners to the team to the, to the way that we kind of work as a brand and not only just williams esports but williams racing our, you know our heads are on the line if they make a post that's, that affects all of the guys and the girls in the factory and, and the work that's done on the, the drivers so but controversially with the way that f1 is in the real world we have to be careful with what our drivers say and then sharing opinions and stuff like that um it's really tough more notably as you say f1 is 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 I think more in the spotlight so it gets uh, you know anything negative you put out there gets seen quicker and it, and it spirals out of control quicker and if anything f1 esports is a really good thing that we have on the team to show the rest of the drivers how not to use social media <laughs> because it's a really good example of again they put a tweet out and then it gets deleted and as you say the consequences and the problems it causes for the team when we've already got 10 to 12 events in a week you know, and not many staff to sit here and filter through everything that's done Part of being a team player is making sure that you're keeping on top of the way you're using social media so we don't disallow drivers to use social media but instead 
if for example we get taken out of turn one instead of just calling that driver out we find a nice you know civilized and professional way of saying what happened at turn one because it's also something we discuss a lot you know it's fair for a driver to share their, their opinion or what happened because often it's not broadcasted in f1 esports you know you see lots of replays in the real world but with f1 we're noticing crash in p12 and nobody knows about it they just see the final result and that can be quite bad to their following because they go ah well they finished p15 but actually we finished p15 because of x y and z and they should have that ability to explain why and it's fair for them to tell their audience why but we've also got to be careful because if they make a post and their audience see the post or if they share a video feed instantly if you've got 10,000 followers that support you those 10,000 followers are going to hate the person that hit you at one be it their <laughs> fault or not um and so we have to be careful from that side and, and like before we already pointed out these drivers are very young and mentally if you had you know, even 100 people coming onto your back and saying you're a bad driver i can't believe you did this to this other driver it's a really bad thing to have doesn't matter if they're part of the teams or where they're from we, we kind of look out for that too and the biggest thing we do with drivers is to make sure that instantly after the races they don't just make a post um mm, you know yeah. we sit down we work with them and we say what is it you want to post this is how we can help it this is how we can filter it if we feel it's a bit too negative um and again it helps for us because we can use the real f1 driver scenario and say well look what nikki and albon would do if they've had bad luck they never just post something crazy on social media unless it's something super strong that that all 20 drivers are in unison about um so it is tough there's no right or wrong way to do it and i think unlike working in an office space where you can stop somebody from doing something straight away your discord you do have that internet filter and again that that's a problem for discord chats that go out of control for bop testing or whatever um but also for just generally anything that that can be seen negative in the industry so you know more recently any exploits or bugs that we find on games you know the internet will react to that and how it reacts to that but let Let's not join the internet. Let's just keep ourselves as a team standpoint. And if we have an opinion as a team, then we'll, we'll always stick with that too. Right, right. And so, we're kind of here as a filter as well, right? I mean, it's the same with if you are a driver and you go out to complain about, even if BOP, I say complain, but let's say give feedback for BOP not being in your favor and um, you sort of put it into a Discord channel, you're not going to see kind of a reaction to that in the right way. You're just going to see all the other drivers in different cars go, no, you're wrong. And then there's an argument. Whereas if we sit internally and say, guys, let's work together, let's make the data, let's do what we need to do, bring it to myself, and as you know, from Williams, I then share that, we get to see it as a team, and it's a team that says, hey, we disagree with the BOP, we'd like to see this change. And even if they say no, it's not been a driver that's specifically singled out for trying to make a change, it's, it's a team, and that's a lot better for us. I'd rather it be me than, than any of the drivers. All right. Now, you say you don't limit them on social media, but you, you know, obviously try to guide them into the correct path what about streaming so when these guys are racing do you allow them to stream and or make youtube content of the races that they enter into yeah absolutely yeah something we're encouraging is the guys to do a bit more streaming as well a lot of them are quite scared to stream um, oh. but we encourage them to stream in their own languages or whatever they need to do and, and our twitch channel is now becoming more and more active with drivers being able to sort of take it over for an hour two hours and, and bring their audience into a sort of central place oh, that's kind of neat. as well um but there's no real filter you know these guys know that the way our brand works they know what they can and can't say um and if we see it then obviously we will chat to them there's no real penalty it's ne never really a place in williams for us to sit here and give harsh penalties and say you're a bad driver because you didn't do this it's a place to make mistakes and learn from them and that's what i think fundamentally we're here for is to say please make this mistake with us because when you get the real world it won't be forgiving if you get into a real race team they will just cut your contracts i mean there'll be no discussion about it whereas we can have five ten discussions this year but as long as point a at the start of the year and point b at the end of the year we've seen an improvement that's fine that's that's a good development as long as the pace is there as well right of course <laughs> How have you how have you found the process of kind of accepting your position and realizing that this responsibility now lies on your shoulders, right? So I was looking at your LinkedIn profile um, and what you did before was from as from what I can tell was was camera operating and then you were massive into sim racing and then you've got this spot in Williams and you're in a serious management position where you're dealing with people like has there been have you done anything in your past that you think has prepared you for this or 
is it a case if you've just kind of applied a bit of common sense your own interpersonal skills and you've just kind of learned as you've as you've gone yeah i think so a few Few things that helped me is one i was doing community management and also working with companies in sim racing previous to, to williams so it was something i was doing for fun product development working on simulators blah blah um, but also running community teams like the same as you guys and what have you um you know working with the community being part of the community and having a team of people that they weren't paid to do it and there was nothing keeping them there so it, the only thing to keep them there was for me to kind of work with these guys um and that was really fun and, and i did quite a bit of drive myself often and worked with these you know up and coming drivers that had a real good chance of going to top teams um but even the ones that didn't have a chance so they would throw up different problems and stuff so you had a really good chance to learn the way the industry worked and what people responded to in the right way and wrong way so that was quite good prep but before that with the camera operating it was a very high pressure situation always you know you never had a chance to get something wrong if there's a a list actor that we're working with and the shot needs to be in focus and my job is to keep it in focus if it's not in focus at the end of it that's the last time i'll be working there so it is really critical to make sure that the team of people that surround you are working as proactively and as efficiently as possible so a lot of what i was doing before was managing a smaller camera team of between five to ten people which was built up of runners other camera assistants um and making sure everything we could ever do uh, for the dop director of photography the person that was sit above the camera operator was always done um and that could be in a nice studio with teas and coffees or or it could be on the side of the mountain at minus five degrees with every battery dying and you only have a 20 percent of battery to use for five shots and so that kind of high pressure environment for the years i was doing it was just something built into me and it's something that is very intense but it's always about everybody working to get the same goal which is exactly what we're doing in the team now and it's actually quite a rewarding thing to, to work with everybody and either get a good result in the race or just look back at the last few years and see the progression that we've made um you know a little win for us is getting drivers so f1 races we ticked that off a couple of years back and now we're ticking it off even bigger by saying we've actually got more drivers from different parts of the world out to races out to different events than f1 and that's a huge thing for us so that kind of management side and again working with steven and javi to, to build that up too is a huge reward for us and like you say a lot of pressure and a lot of um kind of looking on us for for events you know we are at the helm ultimately when it comes down to what the drivers do but there's only so much we can do, right? So when the dr driver gets in the car for that qualifying lap, it is ultimately on their head for what lap time they put in, and it, the spotlight does, you know, fall on those guys. So I think that if we were doing everything wrong from our side in terms of, and I'm not saying we're doing everything right, but if we were not not supporting these guys, leaving them to stay in their rooms, giving them some money to keep them quiet and, and contract them to us, I think that would be what we'd be doing wrong. Um, and I think it's a balance between the driver and team. I think it's less like a real race team where you would look at a CEO and there's a lot of pressure on the driver's market and making sure the right driver's in the spot. There's quite a lot of flexibility here to, to not make mistakes, but to work with drivers and, and to go through life together. Right. I think one of the coolest things that, that you mentioned is <clears throat> changing the overall, I guess, view of what esports is, right? So esports has always been kind of looked on as kind of, I don't know, almost even a joke, I want to say, in a way for... for it's up, upcoming, um, and even now, so when I mention GridFinder to some older generations in my family, they're like, wait, so people play video games this seriously? And, and, and it just boggles my mind that we still are in a world where esports, video games, and professions that are within the world of video games are still viewed as kind of like a, almost a joke. I'll say it again, you know? It's very weird because even content creation. So if you're a Twitch streamer, if you're a YouTuber, you can you can make a very legitimate living on that. So I like that Williams is trying to change that overall view and in, in trying to educate and also putting the team behind it. Because it sounds like, I mean, within reason, you have to have a full support team just like an F1 team has to have. Now there's different roles there, but it's still a whole team of people. So would you say that Williams and their esports program, uh, I mean, I'm assuming you're going to say yes, they're in it for the long haul at this point. So do you think there there's some big plans coming out from your team that's trying to en enhance the sport of sim racing? Yeah, I think we've seen this year, 
particularly probably the best engagement of the main race team for, for sim racing for us. And I think we've really kind of stood our ground and said this is how important it is to not only Formula One, but motorsport with us being at events, us taking simulators around the world, with you know, not just the partners you see on our top, but also the, the main partners that sponsor the main race team. We're supporting heavily with uh, you know Duracell, Bang Olsen to send out rigs to places all around the UK and, and globally. Um, you know, we've been in Miami, we've been in London, we're in Singapore at the minute on the build up to to the race weekend with with simulators. And what we're seeing is just a mass of young and, and even older generations just understanding sim racing, just jumping in the rigs and just wanting to drive. And it doesn't matter if they're competitive with it. They become engaged with us in, in esports and they get an interest for it and they're you know, not every Everybody's going to just go home buy a simulator and then set up, but they might watch it. They might become a supporter of Williams Esports or a fan of, of Williams Racing or just a general, you know, sim racing enthusiast, which is mega. Um, and that's a lot of what our work is about: trying to show the world what what this is and and bring people in. And I think that um, we're all ambassadors as teams to to bring in um, more talent, but also to bring in more audience. And fan engagement is huge um, for any team, especially a right. team like ours that demands that because the results aren't something that's driving in the audience that we have to work on on bringing in fans in a different way so that's a huge side again in terms of hospitality um you know the esports lounge is fully booked up always with people coming in and wanting to use the simulators to have competitions and events track side we're seeing it too uh, in the motorhome we've got simulators as well that you know there's, there's williams esports rigs everywhere i've lost track of them at one point <laughs> we knew where they all were and i think we will kind of go and ah, they're everywhere um but again that's why i say you know, our partners and brands are in this as well because their name gets out there in the same way as we keep pushing it out. You know, every new sort of uh, sim racing enthusiast goes, Oh, you know, where do you get the PC from? How does this work? And again, that drives people into iRacing, ACC, and onwards. And we can build the sim racing esports up more. I think that's the reason why um, maybe in, in esports we're still a relatively small subcategory, um, but we're still making a name for ourselves and we're still pushing boundaries. And those main stage events are starting to come in more where um again we're working with you know the same organizers of, of real 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 world race events and that's massive to us because it gets us into those marketing teams and gets to the right places and it pushes it out and the likes of esl get on board with games like ren sport and the development there and that could be huge for us to, to really just make it out there and have just one main stage competition that could be what puts us in the kind of main eye of esports and i think you know in terms of people involved in sim racing the percentage of those interested in esports and interested in, in what you guys do what we do and, and everything is really high um we just need to push globally those numbers up um right. but i think we need to look for more game even just bringing gamers into what, what even f1 is i think f1 is probably the biggest game to bring those into sim racing arguably game simulator all that kind of develop you know <laughs> argument will always be there but right. again <laughs> either, <laughs> either way it's still still a racing game shall we say and, and that's important to bring bring people in so so there's a it is really important to, to keep pushing. There's a really unique thing that kind of separates sim racing from, let's say, Call of Duty. We'll just use that as an example, right? So if I was to sit my wife in a sim rig, she's, she's an adult. She drives around city and everything. She may not be the fastest driver, but she can still play the game and she can get better and better over time. But if I put a controller and say, okay, play some Call of Duty, the learning curve to be able to do the two joysticks and all the other, you know, little intricacies of the controller are a lot different than, say, a sim rig. So I think we do have a little bit of an advantage here when you mention some of the older crowd that's getting interested there, that the barrier to entry, while monetarily, yeah, it might be a little bit more than your typical Call of Duty or something, the actual execution of racing is a lot easier for people to jump into because, Tom, you're saying that you have in our little co-working space, you just started a lap challenge, a time trial challenge where people from around the co-working space sit down in the sim rig, probably never sim raced ever in their life, and they're still able to get around the track and actually enjoy playing the game. Whereas if you sat them in front of Halo or Call of Duty or, or you know, one of the many first person shooters out there, I don't think that, that, that fun factor would quite be there. So we sit in an interesting place, and with with the help of companies like Williams, like Alpine, hopefully like Gridfinder, you know, I think we can really make this something something that is much bigger, if you know, than the normal 
Call of Duty style esports. I think we have a great opportunity here. Yeah, I think like we've sort of discussed in this, it's we're seeing it more of a sport. It has got that physical side to it as well as the mental side and, and it is something that has crossover skills. You know, you can't find a good footballer through FIFA. You probably could. Probably a good manager, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, maybe. But in terms of the transferable skill set, no, you can't put a driver that plays F one twenty two into a real F one car and expect them to, to turn lap times. Um but I do believe that we've seen it that you can put a sim racer into a real car and, and get good performances and i think mentally we're finding that sim races tend to be stronger it's just the physical side is the shock you go from having minimal sort of feedback from the sim to having everything you know throwing at you the sound the smell the lot um i think we are seeing that there's that chance to put drivers out there um and again those that work in that crossover of being maybe professional race drivers that work in the sim racing world are, are good for kind of bringing that in experience and understanding to help our guys that, that may get a chance too um so I think it's it's a really nice esports position to be in that we have something that helps even just day to day driving. You know, some of the guys have never been out on the roads; they don't even have driver's licenses. Right. I'm sure that this is helping for them to have some sort of car control and understanding. Well, truth be told, sat my son here in this sim rig, put the H shifter on the rig, and had him drive around, and it's. It eliminates the fear factor of sitting in a car a little bit. So yes, transferable skills, 100%, at least in, in that environment of, okay, this is what it's like to drive around in a virtual world so that you kind of get your mind prepped for the real world. Now, Tom over here has taken that one step further and he's actually gone from sim racing rig to real car seat. Now it's in an enduro, is it Ka or Ka? I can't remember. Uh, there was a debate. Chris Hay had a very strong opinion on whether it was Ford KA or Ford car. But despite that, I can't remember which way he swung. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was car. We'll just I think say, it's car. We'll I think it was something about it's a capital K and a small A. So it's a word, so it's car. Anyway, yeah, so, so we race the Ford KA. Yes, yes. So in, in that vein... Is there a spotlight within Williams Esports of maybe we can build the next real driver from our sim racing team? Yeah, I think absolutely that's the goal. And I think that we should, again, like everything, we're, we're wanting to offer out. Right? It's, it's for drivers who, even if we give them the spot, there's still such a financial need in real motorsport that we could get them into a race seat but we would have to support every single driver um, financially for them to, to be something achievable. And, and usually the sim racing side of things is that we're not all from privileged backgrounds. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sat in these. We'd be out on the track doing it. And I think that that's kind of the, the discussion. Um, from our side, I think we'd love to put every driver in a real race car. I don't think it's achievable, but I think there's, there's partners and, and ways of doing it. And it's definitely something we'll always look into, supporting in the best way possible. Um, like I say, some of the drivers do drive in real life but a lot of them have the stories of i was doing really good but next year i needed 150,000 grand and i have that yeah. so you know where do i pull that from and, and um you know that's huge and that's kind of a big question mark and they come back and go back into sim racing um and it's quite a, sh a sad kind of environment for them because they know they've got the potential and they've done it and they spend all their time sort of talking to their peers about real racing because they loved that season they did but didn't have the chance to kind of progress further so mm -hmm. i think there'll always be that financial side that stands in the way um no matter how talented you are it's hard to get out there to show it um and it's hard to get a factory drive even in gt3s where your pay is um to be a race driver so it's really tough um to hit no spotlights and, and even i'm gonna go with ka because that's what i've always called it but even yeah. ford k you could be the, you could be right at the front the, one of the fastest but you know you could stay there for 10 years and, and and never be able to either afford it or get picked up and, and it's it's a real shame because i'm sure there's some really talented individuals that are in there that, that won't get spotted so it's it's really tough you know is it right and you know, I think it's you kind of curve your own path. But like I say, I think if we give them everything up until the point they make that test day, I think after that is them to ride that next stage of the roller coaster. So I want to change tack slightly. Seb, you have a very cool job. Thank <laughs> so, you. <laughs> yes. You work, you work for an F1 team. So you've been around the factory. You've been around the track. I dare say you've been around the drivers. What has been for you the standout moment where you've just gone holy shit, I'm here with this person doing this. How has this happened? 
Yeah, I think there's been a lot of those. I've, I've had that question a few times, and the simple first one was when you've um, you know, been watching motorsport for years. I got to the barrier, and the barrier opened for me for the first time into the Williams factory, and I went, well, this shouldn't be happening. I literally started doing this at home on Discord three years ago, you know, wherever I got to. Um, that was you know, a huge moment. Being at track is also awesome, and, and meeting drivers and talking to drivers, but not to sort of brag, but like you say, you work with a lot of high profile individuals that are in motorsport now and it becomes something that's just normal. And previously I was the same with film and TV. I started working with actors and, and even camera operators that were high in that industry that any um, camera nerds would have loved to have met. And it game, it, it was the same thing. You know, you sat there going, oh, don't really think about it, but this is really awesome. Or you're on set today. And it's just a normal thing for me. Um, being at track and stuff like that, and like you said, being around drivers has been has been just awesome. And I don't think there's been a single moment where I've I've kind of been able to pinpoint which bit has been coolest. I think you still have those moments where you sit there and just go, I I really can't complain. There's nothing I can do now. You know, I want to be at track longer. I'm happy if I'm here all day. Don't want to go back to the hotel. Happy to sleep in the motorhome, even on the track. Fine, it's all good. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 really cool. And I think. I think you know the nice thing has been able to take drivers to that too that have all got aspirations to to just see a car in real life be it at the factory be it um at track and you know, being able to see how everything's done be it that i play my part in a slightly different way with the race team and, and everybody in esports does our, our stuff in a virtual world and i think we're bringing in the fans of the future and we're here to bring in talent of the future as well and even our talent could be engineering talent it could be drivers and a lot of our guys are looking for placements and stuff too I to university so it might be that they come and do stuff with us it might be that they go to other f1 teams or other other motorsport companies but i think it's nice to see every element of, of f1 um, and it, being able to bring people into it is also nice and take people along for the journey and i think it's nice to be almost an ambassador for that don't ever think it's not possible to, to to do something in motorsport or get to that sort of you know those top teams it, you know everything's possible and and really it started with me commenting back to uh, a post on Facebook. Facebook, so that's where it all sort of came from that that i mean it's a pretty inspirational story and it, it's interesting how sim racing has developed in the same way that motorsport has developed whereby you don't have to be a driver to work for mercedes formula one team there's you know tens of thousands of people the support roles the support staff there's data analytics there's engineers there's yeah. chefs there's yeah. bar baristas in the motorhome the you know the guys that are prepping and designing all of the merchant like there's there's a ton of roles and a lot of this is now transferring across to um sim racing what's where do you want to be right so I, I, it sounded a lot like you you've arrived where you're at through kind of this twist of fate now you're in it and now you understand it and you've seen this world have you got your eye on a particular thing a particular space a particular role that you're like yes that's what that's where i want to be in all honesty, no. And I think that that's the next chapter that needs to be written. And, and I think we're all kind of in this place in esports now where, where we all have roles, but we're kind of the generation that's finding out where it goes to. And anybody that's in it now is also in kind of that position of where does it go next? You know, Do we go through a stage of pro drivers finishing being pro drivers, becoming commentators? Do they become influencers? Where do they go? Um, and I think we're all kind of in the same boat where we don't really know. Does an esports press officer stay an esports press officer for forever? Do they just join with the team? Does the team become right up there with the same amount of following as F1? You know, where does it go? Um, I think that's the next bit, and we'll all kind of work out where that fizzles in. And I'm not sure if that transitions to real world motorsport. I'm not sure if it stays in esports. Again, I think that some drivers are also quite divided on this, which is that they might have the dream of being a race driver, but some of them have the brain to tell them that it's probably never going to happen. Mm. So concentrate on being an esports professional, working to climb the ladder in esports rather than motorsport. It's really difficult, and there's no right or wrong way to, to, to go, I don't think. And it's the same with any part of, of esports and sim racing and gaming. But I think for now, I'm quite happy with the way it's going. And like I say, from the, the point A, the starting point of joining the team to now has been brilliant. And as long as that graph is going upwards with what we can do and what opportunities and experiences we're all sort of having and, and, and what we're doing for the esports world is, is, is positive, then for now I'm, I'm quite happy on this this part of the roller coaster. But yeah, like <laughs> you said, I don't know what the next chapter is. Um, I don't think it's being CEO 
of the race team. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I think, like you say, anything is possible. And I think, as you pointed out, a lot of the sort of staff members involved in esports can also go into doing real world motorsport jobs. And that's a nice place for us to be because I think what we're looking at doing is just opening doors to careers in motorsport as well. And again, it's not that you have to, and you can be a sim racing engineer all your life, or you can make it in sim racing as an engineer with Williams F1 and then have a chance to, to go and put that on your CV and take that to a to another um, motorsport discipline. Very, very cool. So we're about 50 minutes in to the to the podcast now, but I think it's time that we throw some laps together in sure. iRacing. racing. So <clears throat> if anybody wants to join us, we are still on the hosted races list, I believe. We are somewhere on here, I believe. But it's, of course, just Sim Sundays uh, with a bar and then Seb Hawkins on there. But yeah, let's jump in. And while we get everyone all set up and started on some laps, Seb, why don't you tell us why you picked this track and car combination to add to your, your actual poll? So we're racing at Watkins Glen with the AMG GT3. And do those hold some kind of significance? And, and is that why they're on there? I think the... The, so the poll was interesting. We also made our individual poll into the race team and said, hey, everybody just into the esports team, everybody just pick a car and track combination. Now, some people were lovely. Some people picked the IR01 uh, hill climb tracks, which was never going to happen. <laughs> um, so what we did is ran that and then picked kind of what the top ones were. And then I added uh, F4 at Donington because I love Donington. Uh, the Formula 4 sounded fun, but everybody was really keen for a GT3 at Watkins. Um, it was the BMW, but I feel as we have a bit of a partnership with Mercedes, it made sense to stick the AMG in there. Uh, yeah, that that does make sense there. I think, I think they'd have preferred that more. Um, also, it drives really well. Um, that's also a perk. So, nice. can't complain. Um, but Watkins, Watkins is interesting. wasn't always my favorite track. I used to drive a lot in R-Factor um, back in the day. Really enjoyed it then. Wasn't so keen on the first version in iRacing, but since the update, it's been actually quite good. Now, we've actually, Watkins Glen, I was joking with Tom, and it's becoming like the Sim Sundays track. We've done Watkins <laughs> more than any other track that we've raced. Um, and it's even, I think it's even taken over. Um, why is my brain not working now, Tom? What's the, uh, the really long one that we race in Germany? Why is my head. In Germany, never agreeing on Nordschleife. Yeah, the Nordschleife. So we, we raced that one a lot as well, but Watkins, with this episode, has officially taken the crown for the most raced track. I personally really like Watkins. We've, we raced in another older one. What year was that one from in the classics, Tom? It was the it was the late fifties, early sixties, so it had like the hay bales as barriers. The hay bales, <laughs> the half buried tires and stuff like that. I managed to flip the car in, in that one fabulously. Uh, but I really like this track. It it just I don't know, it drives very smooth, in my opinion. Now I say that and I'll probably be featured on the stream <laughs> and crash, but that's okay. <laughs> Maybe it's the one with the most straights to answer questions with. Yeah, or at least the uh, at least the long straight. If we'd thought about this enough, we would have made that a consideration. <laughs> okay, it's I remember long. the first couple of tracks we had were an absolute nightmare because they were all old classic cars that you know you put your foot down more than half an inch and the back end spins out immediately. Yeah, like we're gonna do oval racing. Oh great! I've never done oval racing before. Or uh, Danny Juicer from Kavana Gaming was like, let's do uh, Watkins Glen, but let's do it in the NASCARs. Okay. Well, on the oval race, to be fair, Tom, you also made it basically nighttime with on a track that doesn't have any lights in the game. <laughs> yeah, I learned my lesson about timing for, um, for setting up servers. And I started it late afternoon. I was like, oh, that'd be nice. The sun will be setting as we race. But actually the sun was setting as we podcasted and the sun yep. was really set by the time we raced. That was a very interesting race, especially when it, when the sun went fully down, it just became pitch black. There were, there was no light at all. And uh, Jeff, who was, who was actually hanging out with us for that race, 
ended up doing a couple full laps just by memory because he's actually raced that track before in real life. That was pretty impressive. Very impressive. Oof, I am, I am racing like I haven't raced in a while, that's for sure. So when you race something like iRacing or ACC as the Williams team, are you, do you have to choose certain cars because of your partnerships? Um, so not for every car, no. I mean, if we have a partnership that, that allows us to drive us, have an agreement to drive that car for a certain amount of events, but it doesn't mean that every lineup has to be in that car. So we might say that Merc has to be used for one round uh, with one car. Um, and the rest can be whatever. Here we go. The F1 oh, wheel may have been a better option on this one, Tom. This one feels weird on this car for some reason. The Formula Rim? Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely gonna feel weird with that big old wheel. So, Seb, you've obviously done quite a lot of driving yourself before taking the role of team manager. How much coaching do you end up doing to the drivers, or do you try and stay away from that? So I don't do so much coaching with them. Just, I say life coaching. Um, but in terms of actual driver coaching, I don't do any with the guys. I did a little bit um, a few years ago just to help with just community level drivers to help them just get better knowledge of driving and high racing training. Um, but we do have real world drivers there to help with that kind of coaching side. So, um, they actually are classed as driver coaches in our team. Oh wow. The real world drivers coach your esports drivers. Do they, do they, do the real world drivers have to almost translate what they're saying into sim racing uh, languages and techniques? Because there are differences. There definitely are differences between racing the real cars and the sim racing cars. Do you, do your real world coaches have to kind of almost do a little sim racing course themselves to work out <laughs> why it's different? I think it's um, the biggest thing they do is actually help with the sort of data reading and how that should feel in a real race car, or at least a car, should we say. So if you see a graph, that's a brake trace. You know, what does that actually mean? How should that actually feel? If an engineer looks at it and goes, you should be doing that. And the driver goes, well, I am doing that. And then the coach goes, okay, we need to not do that, but this is how. <laughs> it's the easiest way to put it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. almost a translator of data from, from maybe Motec or whatever. So practice sessions for these drivers. Do you guys organize weekly practice sessions and they kind of race each other? Is it a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing where they put laps together and then, like, they look at Motec? How do, how do you do the, the practicing so we have... for the actual events? Yeah, we have, we'll do practice sessions together, but less kind of planned. It's almost just known that everybody will be on events. But we have got to keep in mind we've got drivers in Japan, different time zones. Um, and so those guys will often you know, work through the night, maybe, or at night. And then we have to sort of pick the data up the next day and just get a workflow with the, the other drivers. Uh, but on a whole, everybody will work. If we're doing a special event, say like Petit that's coming up, everybody will work together. Uh, we'll have a big poster session, get on track. Um, it's good for practicing with traffic. It's good with practicing, um, you know, draft and things like that. Um, but even if it's not on track, it's everybody in the same audio together. And then again, there's the same for data sessions too. If the guys want to sit down and look at data, they'll all hop in together. Ooh, I'm spinning. I did it. <laughs> Chris, I was waiting on the stroke for you there. I was like, oh, he's coming around the corner. He's still coming around the corner. That corner is not that long. Why well, are you still turning? Oh, I gone. made it that long, a whole 360. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that corner was too short. Yeah, I figured I'd just make it a little longer. Why not? It's funny because I almost said, well, oh, this car's not that bad to drive. I think it's quite nosy. 
As in, like, like, there's a lot of oversteer with it, I think. But yeah, I there like is, it. and I'm a fan of oversteer. It's got a uh, a lot of diff rotation, especially in the slow speed. If you pull a gear, it likes to slide. Yeah. You can kind of use it a little bit to turn the car. Yeah. If you can control it. Uh oh. Oh, oh, my back end's all over the place. It's spinning. No. <laughs> Oh, Chris, we managed half a lap of racing there. <laughs> I know. Oh, I think I damaged my car too much. All right, I want to meet you on the start finish line. Yep. He goes, let's get this that fixed. This is why we chose to go to track days rather than racing. <laughs> we decided that we were going to do like a proper race every single week, which was good. Like the community liked it. Um, but it meant that Chris and I were concentrating so much that we couldn't really focus on, like, you know, speaking, which in a podcast is kind of important. So right. we decided that we would, uh, we would make it just a track day. But it means it's been a lot more fun because we've just kind of been driving around, kind of trying to group up a little bit and have some battles that we can kind of pretty much artificially prolong. Yeah, and if we crash each other, it's not like, oh, we ruined each other's race, and you just restart and go again. Here we go. Oh, are you on there? Yes, I see you going. Are you both in the pits? Yeah, we both were. Oh, there you are. It's over there. Oh, I see you, Chris. Seb, if you're thinking that you need to get a head start, you don't. <laughs> well, I picked up a black flag, but I think we might end up back at the pits before we need to serve it. Here we go. Careful, careful. That's where I spin all the time because I plant my foot. You know what? This is exactly what happened at Watkins Glen two weeks ago with Dave Cam. We all of a sudden just got a little bit. A little bit racy and a little bit quiet. I know, you, you get into the mode where you're like, okay, I'm with cars now. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, then we both went late then. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> oh, you almost made me flip the car. Nice. Think of the content, Chris. Think of the content. Think of the content. <laughs> Now we're back rolling forward again. So it's going to go in, serve his black flag, come out, and then we'll just be, uh, we'll probably meet up about the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. It is a 26 second stop and go, so I don't think you're that bad. Right, where are you? Oh, there you go. I see. That sign you. just says go bowling. New glass, wow. Corning Museum, new glass, wow. I like uh, some of the signs in our race. Oh, your car blends in with the background really well with that gray <laughs> color. Man. Let's do this. So how, um, how involved did you, whoa. Oh, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Um, you've you've forgotten your question now, haven't you? I have. I have. What was that? <laughs> God. These cars look beautiful. How involved have you been in league racing in the past? Like, how much of a an impact do you think that league racing makes on the pro level sim racing sport? 
Yeah, I mean, I've been involved quite a lot. I did quite a lot of league racing before and you know, done my hand of endurance races with different people, all that sort of stuff, and met a lot of people through league racing too. But I think um, it's really good. Generally speaking, you know, for air racing, we have some really strong league races in there too, and well broadcasted and put together. And you know, it's a balance of that and special events, really. Um, for ACC, the same. We've got some really good leagues in there too. I think, you know, we find good talent as well. I mean, F1 especially, if it's you know PSGL and things like that, are super important for us finding drivers for, for rosters um, so rather than I waiting on the challenges since you mentioned F1 do you only take people that race on wheel or do you also take people that race on controller only people that race on wheel okay yeah I mean um, con controller players can make good development drivers because they still keep the pace and they can be useful for testing um, but generally the wheel is you know, what we're looking for yeah that makes sense but quite a few of our drivers transition from controllers to steering wheels, so you do see that progression a little bit. So you can bring on someone that's controller, but they eventually switch to wheel. So that begs the question, if they sign on as a controller player and then they eventually switch to wheel, is it like a you guys supply the new setup kind of a situation? Yeah, so in terms of equipment and stuff, it's exactly that. Everything we've got from partners we can supply the guys with. So if we did bring somebody on that was good at controller for a reason and then they started to show that they were quick on a steering wheel or maybe they did a land competition, we saw some potential, then we could provide them with equipment to help them. You know, there's always that option available and having companies like Fanatec is it's really good for supplying wheelbases and things like that and we've also got a lot of equipment at the esports lounge and also a facility there where we can just you know, if it drivers local or k base they can come in and spend the day there and use it as they need to let's not make this corner more than it needs to be that's pretty cool so so there is some room for those people who are dreaming of becoming an esports driver but they only play on let's say playstation or xbox or something there's still there's still options for them yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that's you know, fundamentally a part of what we're doing as well. Like I say, it's about being able to bring anybody in. It doesn't mean that you have to have a steering wheel at home. You could still be talented. So we have to keep that option in mind. That's very cool. My driving is, is all the over the place. Sim racing is kind of simultaneously very inclusive but then also not that inclusive because of the price barrier. So other than the price barrier, it's the most inclusive esports ever because it kind of unlocks such a huge amount of opportunity for people who wouldn't be able to afford to go, you know, like you said earlier, so racing for 150 grand a year. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's easier now to get sim racing hardware than it used to be as well. And you know, markets are looking to support those that aren't in particularly best financially stable places as well as you can pick up £150 steering wheel you can even go on Facebook Marketplace and find a, a £25 steering wheel like you don't need yeah. to have brand new and you can get up and running I mean, my first steering wheel was literally a hand-me-down from a family friend and that got me into it so, um, I think as there's so much hardware out there that you're going to see that a lot more too um, I think with the likes you know, of you look at things, Moser and Tractor entering the market, it's going to get a bit more affordable. Yeah. And also, I think not one of the questions is, you know, are we replacing karting with young talent? I think we're working with young talent to give them sim racing to go alongside karting. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, parents that have to spend lots of money on their son or daughter going into karting. You know, they're also in a position now where they can spend a thousand pounds on sim racing hardware instead. That's for then a round of racing. So. Yeah, it almost I mean, like a weekend of new gearboxes in karting. Yeah. It feels like it almost removes the barrier to get into racing, honestly. 
and you, you know you, you don't have to have the cart you don't have to have the money to get into a car you can just have the money to get into some sim racing and there's still a path mm. yeah it's a it's a much different and maybe in some aspects a harder path to get to a real race car but it's still possible it's just another way yeah i think five years ago five six years ago that statement would have been even more true and i think we've gone through a wave of having you know it's easier to get into motorsport and the marketing stand of putting a sim racer in a real car was you know something new and fresh and everybody was excited for it and things like gt academy were really good for that and i think now it's even more competitive to get into a real car you know one of the prizes used to be going out in a real car and now it's winning a sim racing steering wheel or something mm. but i think i think it comes in waves a little bit i think the opportunities are are kind of less there for drivers now and maybe the they would have made it in the top 30 of the GT race before and been four seconds off the pace. And now you're seeing sort of less than a second. Look at everyone esports, it's less than a tenth sometimes. So it's, you know, the cutoff is a lot tighter because so many people uh, are taking part in sim racing. I think the other thing is you made an interesting point there, Chris, about it's cheaper to get into motorsport. But then if you kind of break down, what does get into motorsport look like? It doesn't always have to be, you know, I want to be a professional racing driver and spend all day every day being a racing driver and racing. Getting into motorsport could just mean experiencing the thrill of motorsport. And now this is probably quite a divisive statement, but I think you do get a lot of the thrill of motorsport from sim racing. You know, I, I know the, the, you know, the risk, the danger, the smell, the sound, all that sort of stuff isn't, mm. isn't the same, but the thrill of the competition definitely is you know i i admit that whenever i start like a if i've been preparing for an i racing race so i'm big into the f3 series yeah i've been practicing an f3 um track combination for a while um and i've you know ready for my quarter past seven race or whatever it is when I, i'm qualifying and i grid up i get a proper like adrenaline rush from being yeah. like, ready to go up for this race that i've been preparing for the key one is the left leg not working properly for the uh, the first few corners, yeah, and uh, the the shakes. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's true. The shakes. <laughs> I think um, you know with things like our racing, where you, you're, you know everybody's competitive. I guess when you put them in a in <laughs> an environment like this, but when you you've got the risk of losing our rating or something like that, you know, everybody gets a little bit nervous. And that's I guess that's the sheer buzz of it. I think that's the thing that I might miss a little bit from games like F1 20. Um, I think it, it, it's harder to get into a race straight away and be there with, shall we say, good drivers, as in good racecraft and safety. Because <laughs> um, it is, again, the thing with F1 is it fits in that spot where it's, it's a, fundamentally it's a game and it's accessible for controller players and wheel players and it's a space where you can download it for you know, 40 quid online and you're away racing. And you also don't need to have a particularly good ability to drive you can have all the assists on and it's it's great for events when we stuff as well you can have the assists all on for one person and off for the other person and they're racing against each mm, other and yeah they're smiling so i think with iRacing you have to have a bit of skill there you do have to sort of have some basic understanding to get up to speed quickly otherwise you, you might struggle um you know force feedback and things are completely different but But I think the nice thing with iRacing is that the way the tiers work and the splits you know, accommodates for everybody. You don't have to be an eSports driver to be enjoying it. That's the main thing. Yeah. I mean, the iRacing um, model, the, the online model for iRacing is the only reason I think they can justify the price. I mean, the handling is great. The, the graphics are okay. Like The track choice and car choices is, is, is great. But like it's oh. practically better than something like ACC, in my opinion. But the monthly subscription, which I know is like a really contentious issue, I believe is completely justified because of the constantly changing and dynamic online tournament structures that are created, which are all kind of, uh, you know, managed in terms of ability and ranked racing, etc. cetera. The, the way I see it is, if you like to watch film and TV, you're happily spend £10 on a subscription to Netflix every month. Uh, and 
you'll spend the same amount of time as you would do if you like motorsport and want to do racing every night. You know, it's, it's, I think it's justified, like you say. Um, it's tough because it's not what everybody likes. A lot of people like to just buy the game and have it. Um, oh. I'm back, I'm back. But yeah, I don't think... I think if it was maybe twice the price, then I think that would be the time where people were a little bit more steering away from it. But I think, like you say, the online stretch is so powerful that it's you know it is worth it um i also like maybe the it's tough with the content quality. but yeah I, I definitely prefer the iteration on a single title like constantly kind of improving the one platform rather than re-releasing the, the game every year like in in f1 because it you know it's, it's a great game. I love it. I love the story mode. I love the campaign mode, etc. But in terms of just being like yep. a racer, my issue with it is that it comes out every year and it's buggy because it's a new game. So, that, you know, new UIs and new systems, etc., which always have bugs. Whereas if they brought out a game called F1 and you paid, what is it, 50, 60 quid per game, if you paid yep. that for an annual subscription, but it was the same game and they just, you know, did updates throughout the year and iterated on the same platform. To me, that would be more appealing because you know that the game is going to get better every single year. They're not, I know they don't yep. start from scratch, but you know what I mean? Yeah, agreed. One of the scariest things about jumping into iRacing in the beginning for me, because before iRacing, I was always the Gran Turismo style racer. So you buy that game, and then you have all of the cars in the game. All you have to do is just do yep. a couple things to unlock them. And the intimidating part about iRacing is, yeah, while the yearly membership kind of feels like buying a game annually almost, when you get into it and you're like, wait, I only have eight cars, and they're all different, and I can't drive them on any track I want, and then I only have this many tracks. Yeah. It just feels weird, and you have to get used to the idea that, oh, wait, this is a racing game where I have like a career, so I don't need all of the cars and all of the tracks right off the rip. I need to work myself up to a point where then I need to buy a new track or I need to buy a new car. So that's coming from like a normal game, and I kind of air quote normal as in Gran Turismo or ACC or even Assetto Corsa. It just feels weird that you're so almost limited on content when you just spent, you know, a hundred and twenty dollars for your membership for the year or whatever yeah so it's just a mindset change really when you think about it because i racing really is for those hardcore sim racers where they really do want to have like their driver career over the course of time and i agree with you tom where it's like you're investing into one single racing platform and you know that 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 car that you bought in 20 2018 you you're still going to be able to use it in 2024 Whereas Gran Turismo, you know, you you buy the game, and then the next time the game comes out, you basically have to start over, and you have nothing, and, you know, things yep. are locked. But it just, it's a whole mindset change for sure when you when you get into something like that. Tom, did you just pit maneuver me? Because that's what it looked I, like. No, <laughs> no, no, sorry to name you Jason Davis. It was Jason Davis was right behind you. I saw the crash. And it's oh. annoying because I was 30 seconds behind you about 10 minutes ago, and I've just slowly, every lap, just taken two or three seconds out, and I finally, finally caught you, and then I saw you spin, and I was like, no! No, I thought, for God, some reason, I thought that was you back there. No, it was not. No hard feelings, Jason. That's why we do the practice. That's fun. <laughs> That's why we do the track day. <laughs> and it's probably more my driving, not his driving. He had the right line, and I'm just, like, all over the place. I would yeah, be willing I to accept that. Oh, I was just saying it was... It was <laughs> He, you make contact with him. That's all we're saying. <laughs> Your Honor. But he was in the back. It's his fault, right? Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> I think that's the rule. Right. Yeah, iRacing as a platform is a very cool and obviously a very successful business model. But it, it does take a little bit of, okay, I have to change my mindset about what this game actually is. Because, you know... Like I said, people are used to buying a game, having all the content, yeah, maybe locked behind something like a, a driver's license test or maybe winning five or ten races or whatever. All in all, it's a good platform and I do enjoy it. Plus, it while there are bugs because it is a game, it drives reliably, you know? It feels 
good. Now, yeah. I, I've never driven an actual car on a racetrack, but generally speaking, I, I feel like everything controls the way I would expect, and, and nothing just feels weird. For instance, F1, the latest F1 game, is it 2023 or 22? I can't remember which one. So, in that game, when you start up that game, it feels like there's a lot of configuration that you have to do in order to make it feel like a normal sim again. You have to, like, take away all the arcadeness of it so that it starts to feel like you're driving for real instead of, like, kind of driving on rails almost. And uh, that's something that kind of ultimately turned me away because I was racing with the, the Formula RSS car in AC for a long time. And, you know, AC is a very good simulator. And then when I went into the F1 cars in F1 2022... I was like, there's just something off. There's just something that doesn't feel like I'm really in control of the, of the car. Until you dive into the options and set your radiuses for your wheel, turn off some of the assists, do all kinds of extra configurations. Yeah, agreed. It does feel a bit funky. Um, it took me a bit of time to get used to driving F1. I think it just... I had to treat the game completely. I had to treat it as a game. I think that's the, the key thing. Yeah. So I've actually, a couple times, because I think it, most people that are, they're, well, I won't even say most people. I am a, an F1 fan as well. And I've kind of started to get a kick out of watching Lando Norris stream. <laughs> because when he, he's like a, he's, you know, obviously a real F1 driver. But and then when he plays the game, you're just like, wait a minute. Shouldn't he be winning everything? Shouldn't he be just beating everyone so he's a real driver? But, you know, he'll make the wrong decision in the pit stops. And, and then, like, I can feel that because I'm like, yep, I've, I've done that exact bad decision before in the pits. And, you know, he's, he's out in the rain on slicks and spinning everywhere. <laughs> but you're a real F1 driver. You should know all the strategies. You should, you should know all the things. It, and you kind of get disconnected from the fact that no, he's he's the driver. Like sometimes it's it's the guys in on pit lane that are making those choices for him. He doesn't necessarily know the best and and be, end all be all strategy. Yes, of course he does have a good idea of what he would prefer, but sometimes that's not his job. I guess I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. It's interesting that you chose the slicks in the wet scenario, though. Give me that he did actually make that call for real. I know. <laughs> he did. He did for real, right? So, the actual F1 drivers from Williams, do they participate in the esports stuff as well? Yeah, so sometimes they use it as a training tool, a little bit of track familiarization stuff. Um, just working with drivers just to get used to, to tracks ahead of race weekends. Um, some, it's quite common for that to happen. Um, and over the last few years, the same as well, not just specifically this year or anything, but with like the likes of Jeddah come into the game before they even got a chance to drive it. It was quite mm -hmm. good for them to turn some laps and get used to where it goes. Not for particularly accuracy, but more just to understand it. Um, and it also helps when our guys race against them for them to understand sort of what could happen. Mm -hmm. um, how to work with them on track to gain lap time, etc. Um, They've done a fair bit in iRacing as well. Um, Nikki's been quite quite keen on doing some stuff there too. So it's been really nice. And again, another nice thing for our drivers to work with real drivers and witness that crossover, just chatting about it in person, you know, similar to this. But being able to talk to somebody who does it you know, every weekend, and it's, it's really nice for the guys. It gives them a lot of motivation and relevant. How things are going for us as a team, it's still, you know, these guys are plenty of the top athletes you know right. in, in motorsports so i think it's been uh, it's been really good in that sense and i'd like to see them more active but i don't think the race schedule allows them to be the oh. winter periods are normally the best time right that makes sense there was an interesting conversation we had with jeff mcconey from mcconey setup shop where he was telling us that he actually does get the chance to talk to some real engineers about the setups that he's making for sim racing and the relationship between them and the actual setups that they're using on track and surprising to me at least was the fact that the decisions that jeff was making in his setups were the same decisions that they were making for the actual setups of the real cars on the tracks as well so the synergy between sim racing there 
is kind of unique. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that if you're good at doing sim racing setups, you could you should go and apply as a race engineer <laughs> for for one of these teams out there. But I am, it's I guess I am suggesting it's a good way to sharpen skills. So if you maybe you're in in school for becoming a race engineer and you need to just kind of practice on something that's a little less impactful. Than yeah. Obviously. It seems like sim racing is a great idea and a great one to one or at least. 0.8 to 1 match of what it would be like to be an actual race engineer too. It's kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think you learn also from what I've seen uh, recently in, in like F1 esports there's been drivers, you know, you know, engineers working with drivers having to get used to the right way. You know, how best do I deliver this information during the race to, to not distract them from what they're doing and that's also a fundamental part of being a race engineer. You know, building that relationship with your driver is it's also huge. Um, but like you say, when it comes to setups, we are generally seeing a similar trends to real life um, and even pro drivers are jumping in rigs like the Fanatec arena and the, the GT World Series and they jump in and make adjustments to the setups as they would do in real life and they know that that's going to work it might not be optimal for the um, you know in terms of an esports driver but they are making setup adjustments that they believe are, would be correct and they are sort of responding in the same way they add some more step this to the front axle you know they know what it's going to feel like and it does generally do the, the same um often it's things like tire pressures that might catch them out especially acc True. and things like that just some little iterations and tire model too you know tires in real life change between brands quite substantially so right they have to get used to that as well but it is quite interesting and even like you say real race engineers coming into sim racing are kind of mesmerized a little bit by how real it is. I mean, one of my iconic kind of moments, to go back to sort of a conversation earlier, was sat in the airport to fly out to, I can't remember where it was now, but I was with Nikki's race engineer, just sat next to him, and we were debriefing from on, on a call on Discord from about 24 hours in night racing. And I was looking at the data from the engineers, and he looks over and he was like, what's this? And I was like, this is our engineering debrief and data. And he was like, <laughs> That looks identical to our data. That's crazy. And I was like, that's, yep. <laughs> that's it's amazing. the same. And, you know, those guys and the race team are really interested in what we do. Um, like you say, it's it's new talent that could come in. You know, it's engineers that we're working with in the, the sim racing world that can go and have a chance to do stuff in the, in the real world. Um, that's, you know, really important to us. See, these kind of conversations make me laugh because, like, Tom, your, your com, or not conversation, but your comment from earlier where you can't just play video games all day, every day, and for your, the rest of your life. But now it's like video games uh, using sim racing, like we're talking about, can literally prepare you for a later career. Can not only can you have a career in the sim racing itself, but you can go to that next level and you can be in a, you know, a real race engineer or, strategist or you know whatever it may be on the side of a an actual racetrack that's so cool it's especially yeah. in the simulation genre right so like um a friend of mine so i was in the navy before i was into sim racing and a friend of mine um now works in a division of the navy where they're looking for mill sim games basically on steam to yeah. like train their command and control functions on the you know on the, the battlefield um, yeah which is i think um I, I might be wrong here but i'm pretty sure the british army guys are using um world of tanks currently to out strategize <laughs> each other and sit and do five on five use it as again like having it in the office to play around with um but just to keep their minds active and working together and, and stuff like that and it's really quite interesting and again that's interesting to me as somebody that does what i do interesting to see the army using a tank game to try out strategize other people but it is i think it's more included in what our day-to-day -day lives are about than we actually even know ourselves um like you say i think there's so many skills you can take into esports and there's so much you can take out of it and it can also work alongside your career as well you don't have to be in there making money in esports but you can be doing something that contributes to what you do that's also pretty powerful. Yeah, you can just enjoy esports and sim racing. Doesn't have to be. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a career path, right? 
but it's yeah, it's, and that's it. Exactly. But, it's certainly, you know, a far more valid career path in the minds of people who who influence children's decisions at the moment. Like, if you think that the um, esports and gaming is a bigger industry than music and film combined, like that's a you know yeah. you can't you can't put that statement next to a statement that says you can't spend your whole life gaming. So you definitely can if you want to. Well, it's the yeah. entertainment industry, you know, because there was that old, there's that old meme. I don't know if you've seen it, where it's let's say it's it's a cartoon character that walks into the to a room full of kids and they're watching Twitch or what they're watching a streamer play, just a random game, right? And he's like, I can't believe you want to just watch that. Why don't you go play the game yourself? And then the next frame of the comic is that same person who just said that sitting in front of the couch watching a football game, eating their popcorn. It's like. Those are like a one-to-one -one match, realistically, when you, when it comes down to entertainment value. And then the one thing that we kind of touched on briefly when, when you mentioned that you're not going to play FIFA and then go professional footballer, you could be a sim racer and then eventually become a professional racing driver. So technically, if we really want to break it down, video games are better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and even with that, you know, like, you could like a FIFA and just completely pick it apart and say, well, actually, you wouldn't be a professional footballer from just playing FIFA. But you could have a job in football by meeting people oh, yeah. through playing FIFA with other individuals. And, and like you said, you could maybe coaching, strategist yeah. and stuff like that definitely would, no, would come into play. The best in the world would probably make decent managers and coaches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, also, there's what, F1 manager? Yeah. That teaches you managing an f1 team and in, in a co of course a controlled environment with artificial intelligence so it's a lot different but still the strategies are all kind of sound and and the ideas behind what you're doing are pretty sound it's very interesting how how video games are kind of changing the way people can educate themselves yeah Oof. oh god oh. <laughs> sorry oh man <laughs> i took i took two very wide lines in a row there <laughs> Oh, God, my steering. <laughs> well, with that wonderful take out there, um, we're about an hour and a half in. So do we have any viewer questions out there? Let's see. I didn't pull up the Discord very reliably on this no. episode. Yeah. So I'm going to quit out of iRacing for the time being. So I research if we have any, any viewer questions. So... <clears throat> I think we, we kind of touched on this, but what's the next step for Williams Esports? What do you think is the next big thing that, that we will see, if you're allowed to share from Williams? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, I don't know if there is a next big thing, because, it, you know, everything, we're almost kind of spinning plates. Right? We're keeping so many different things happening at the same time, and it just takes something to make that one thing suddenly stand up, like going to, if we use the example of going to a real-life event, we got into a position where, um, you know, Dolson takeover happens. We became gave us some instability, um, and once that fixed itself, it actually allowed us and enabled us to do a lot more, with, which has been mega and really good. Um, so I think, you know, it's kind of just whenever the next thing clicks and the next thing happens. But there's nothing really on the horizon at all that we can sort of say is the next biggest thing. But I think anything could could top what we've done so far. You know, it's right. this year. I remember start of the year i don't think we had any event out of the uk booked in as sort of traveling away and, and confirmed by the end of it i think we've all been out of the country just the, mo the most ridiculous amount traveling to events and getting out there and meeting people and, and doing for LAN events gaming festivals and that's been you know huge so i think yeah it's tough to, to pinpoint an area where we're going to actually just rise up suddenly but i don't think there's anything right crazy on the horizon but yeah <laughs> right that makes sense now i guess when you're asking that question that's to be suggested that you we've done everything in the world of of esports and i think esports has a ton of room to grow even though call of yep. duty and their world league and everything got massive and valorant and all those first person shooters and dota and things are doing things i believe that sim racing as an esport is going to make massive moves in the next couple of years if not within the year to be honest with you um, do you yourself stream or make content on YouTube? 
Not particularly. I will upload the odd hot lap for just my own satisfaction onto onto YouTube, just so I've got it and seen it. And often I share it with people that would like to kind of learn to be a bit quicker and just as a, a friendly kind of coaching type of uh, of, of effort. Um, streaming wise, no, because I haven't really been in a position to one have the time, but two the graphics card to make it com- actually enjoyable to stream without sure. going down to twenty FPS, which is painful. <laughs> Um, but I did do a test stream the other night, so who knows? Um, like anything, it's just the commitment and time to do it. But I think um, you know it's always something I've been interested to do. But also with the the, the way that the broadcasting is going on our, our Twitch channel for Williams, you know there might be a chance to do a lot more streaming there and, and pushing socials and stuff. But I think there's definitely been an increase for a lot of us for, for social media. So there's probably more of an opportunity now to to stream and have an engagement with our audience, which. Is also really important and a crucial part of what we do is just meeting people and explaining what we do so that we can right. widen the eyes of everybody. And, and you know, the more you speak to people, the more everybody understands. And that's been the same even in the race team and what sim racing is. Um, so I think maybe streaming is a good, a good route to showing people uh, and giving them an insight as well. So if some of our listeners or viewers wanted to catch some of your esports teams, where's a good place to kind of get attached to the events and the stuff that you're putting out so i definitely say go over to the the twitch channel just williams esports you'll you'll find us and there's the schedules always updated and we're always trying to push and do more we're limited to a certain degree with what we are doing at the moment but we're pushing the boundaries of, and, and again like you say touch upon in the future at the moment we, we have a relatively small audience um but again that's one of the big goals is to to flip that and we have the power to but we want to do it the right way and we want to make content that's that's engaging and unique rather than just uh you know um, making kind of similar content and like you guys making something different trying something out and just trying what the community likes and enjoys um but then also you know any of our williams esports socials and um perfect twitter and facebook and stuff like that we're always so pumping it, out content it'll be williams esports to find yep. find you guys in all the pretty much yeah okay yeah um, very cool yeah, there's always something. There's probably a post every day with an event and and something in there. And I think we engage all the different communities within sim racing too. You know, the rally, oval, road, so ACC, i racing. So it's... something out there for whatever your your flavor exactly. of sim racing happens to be, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, Tom, do you have any last questions for Seb? Or thank you, thank you very much for your time. It's been incredibly interesting. I'm always baffled by the the detail level that goes into sim racing we're kind of used to it now in motorsport you know if you watch formula one and you listen to the the pre-race shows the post-race shows you listen to the interviews with the team managers and the engineers and then you watch something like drive to survive on netflix it's you know i think we're kind of we're very like overexposed to the detail and dedication that goes into real world motorsport but it still gets me even working nine to five monday to friday i wish i worked nine to five Monday to friday um <laughs> in sim racing it still baffles me when i hear about the levels of dedication that you see from organizations such as williams and Al- alpine and Kavana and you know all the all the pro teams that we've spoken to um but the the levels that they go to to not just knock off tents on the racetrack but to build something of their team and I think today was the the interesting thing that will stick with me was the the kind of holistic approach you take to the career of your drivers, be that a long term racing career or just them as people. So yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And thank you very much for your time. Yeah, no worries. It's been nice chatting to you. And again, it's good to share our side of it too. You know, and and every team's going to take a different approach. But I also think that every team searching for the same thing in esports you know we're all looking to do the same thing and, and raise its um appearance in the motorsport world and, and just in general so appreciate it well seb hopefully someday i get the pleasure of meeting you in person and tom can get you in person maybe even one of these days grid finder and williams esports can do some kind of collaborative effort together and yeah. that would be amazing never know you never know but we appreciate your time today and of course this episode will be released next Sunday morning on all podcast services. So thanks for joining us today. And if there's nothing else, we will see you guys next week.